Well, hello, everybody. It's me again. It's World War II TV, and we are talking about the Bomber Command program to stop the V-1 flying bombs. And to join me, my special guest today, first time on World War II TV, but definitely won't be the last time. We've already got a show scheduled next month, and I can see more happening, is Steve Darlow, prolific aviation and bomber author. So uh, good evening, Steve. How are you? Good evening. Fine. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, it's I'm, I'm all the pleasure is all mine. So, Steve, okay. with regards to the particular countermeasures against the V1, how did your interest come about, and um, and where did you get started with that aspect? Well, it, it it came subsequent to my first book. I wrote a biography of my grandfather and he, his crew, and um, they were involved in that late forty three, early forty four period, and I became aware of this campaign that Bomber Command had against the V weapons. Uh, sites during that particular period and I couldn't find a lot that, that was um, had been published about it so I thought well here's an opportunity uh, spoke to the publisher and uh, we decided to write a book that focused specifically on Bomber Command's role uh, in combating the V1 obviously the V weapons there are the V2 and the V3 but this this specifically focused on the V1 and we called the book Sledgehammers for Tin Tacks because uh, Ted uh, famously said that using the, the heavy bombers was like using a sledgehammer for a tin tax so that's the title title we used so that then it was into the archives into the interviews corresponding with the veterans uh, and putting putting the book together and it you know it revealed quite a remarkable campaign really um I, I didn't i didn't know beforehand but i found that a greater tonnage of bombs was dropped on v weapon sites than throughout the whole of 1942 on all targets wow the tonnage, yeah the greater tonnage was dropped on V1 to, uh, V weapon targets and was dropped on Berlin through the entire war. So this is a considerable campaign that um, that Bomber Command were involved in. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I was just saying before we went online, folks, that when I, you know, doing my little prep for the show, I'm always when I get into the investigating V1s and the and the countermeasures, I'm always surprised, reminded myself of how early the campaign began because I tend to think of it in the kind of once they started sending them against Britain, that you know the famous footage of the Spitfire tipping the wings of the V1, that kind of thing, and the and the, and the famous film Operation Crossbow with George Peppard and Sophia Loren who gets bumped off by Lily um, uh, Palmer, but it obviously starts a lot earlier. So so Steve, let's go back to very the basics. Um, and there's a point when we didn't know about the V program, and then there's a point when we do about the, know about the V program, and we start immediately on our on our quest to uh, find well, initially find information about what these things are, and then yes. what we're going to do about them. So, at what point did Bomber Command get involved in the in the process? Um, the first major direct attack was the Pinamunda raid in August 43, but that was, whilst V1s were being developed there, that, that was mainly countered the V2 imminent threat. So evidence had been building up very, very early on in the war, there's a thing called the Oslo Report, where uh, information was coming through, reconnaissance, uh, and, and mentioned Pinamunda, reconnaissance, there'd been reconnaissance, there's famous lady Constant Babington Smith, who identified a V1 on a ramp um, at, at Pinamunda. Propaganda is building about retaliation that's going to be coming from the, the offensive. The Allies are listening in to captured soldiers who are starting to talk about free weapons, um, putting microphones in, the, in their cells. Um, there's the monitoring of signals for the, the testing of some of this weaponry that's going on on the Baltic coast. So you talk by about the spring of, of 1943, um, enough evidence had really come about that it, they could really launch a, a major investigation uh, into this uh, it's called it's called body line in fact the, uh, the the v1 sites were called no ball sites so it's obviously some cricketing uh, fan in there i think they called them no ball sites because they felt that the germans were, were really stepping over the mark so it was a <laughs> no ball but um so there's two there's two types of weapon at this point there's the v2 rocket and there's the v1 flying bomb which we're going to be uh, be focusing in now but enough evidence had come around middle of 43 Pina Munda very much was was featuring and there was decided for a major bomber command attack uh, against Pina Munda itself which took place in, in August 43 um, just short of 600 aircraft took part 40 40 were lost uh, and it, it had a, a dramatic impact but if, the, if then we just progress on from that and sp focus specifically on the 
um, the V1. In August 1943, there was what was called the Bornholm incident, where um, a V1 crashed on the island, Danish island of, of Bornholm, and uh, managed to get photographs and drawings, managed to, to, to reach London. And then in October that year, you've got agents in France starting to report back of sites that are appearing in, in northern France. So um, we've, got a, we've got a picture, haven't we, uh, of number one uh, there. Of, uh, yep. There we go. Array. So that's the, the Bois Carry um, site that was one of the first reported sites, and it's photographed uh, by reconnaissance there. And if you can see at the front there, you've got that distinctive shape um, with, with the curve at the end. And that distinctive shape is what gave the sites the name the ski site, because viewed from above, it looks like a ski. The reason they're designed like that is the V1s would be stored inside that, um, inside there. And then if it was attacked, the curve was to prevent blast traveling, traveling down in, inside. Um, so this was the, the, the Bois Carré site. Also as part of the site, you'd have a building, what was called the, the square building, and that would be aligned. Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if you can quite see it in that one. I've, we've got another photograph coming up where I can show you an, an actual square building. Um, and interestingly, that's because there, there's magnetic compass for the V1. That is aligned on the, in the same direction as the ramp is as well, quite mm. distinctively. Um, so there was the photographing of all these sites that took place in northern France. And it was becoming apparent. Oh, and there was a comparison of these sites in France and against some of the buildings that had been photographed on the Baltic coast where there was testing going on of the V1s. So it was clear, and the Allies knew about this, so it was clear that these sites in northern France were linked to what was going on with the V1 testing. So clearly the Germans were preparing a, a V1 offensive in northern France. Uh, Lord Cherwell, he, he reports through to um, Churchill, who was at the Cairo conference, conference it was November of 43, uh, and he talks about the scale um, of what's there. If I just refer to my notes, if I can. Yeah, sure. he, he, he says, um, it, he talks about the comparison between the two sites, and he says to Churchill, it seems almost certain that the ski sites are intended for this weapon, the V1. Um, and then he goes on to describe it. He says carry a bomb weighing about two tons. It's actually, I think it's um, just short of 2,000 pounds, the actual warhead uh, that comes with the V1 as well. But they're talking about 60 uh, to 100 sites that they've identified that are they're under construction. And the Allies, they're, they're able to, to start plotting these. We've got another image, if we could share the, the alignments of the... Yep, there we go. So this is a plot you've got of the actual site and the alignment of the launch ramps. Clearly London is, is going to be targeted, as is uh, Portsmouth, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, Southampton. Yep. Um, you've got it in, in there as well. And the most of these sites are in the Pas de Calais, going down towards uh, Normandy area there, a few, few in the Cherbourg um, Peninsula. So now this is an act, this is a threat, a definite threat that's going to materialize at some point. How to counter this? And a decision is made to ask for some of the resources of, of Bomber Command uh, to come in and make an attack. Now, Bomber Command at this stage, so this is the winter of 43, just come through the Battle of the Ruhr, been in raid, but, uh, just before that, the Battle of Hamburg. Harris involved in Sir Arthur Harris, Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command. This is his main offensive. He's now focusing his attacks on Berlin. He wants the Americans to come in. He thinks if the Americans can come in, he can, uh, that's the game changer for the war. But that's not gonna be the case. The Americans are still um, licking their wounds, I should say somewhat, from some of their daylight raids earlier in 43. And, we, and then that's gonna develop as the Mustang and the long range tanks of the Mustang get involved. However, Bomber Command is being used as, as a strategic bomber force uh, and it's attacking Berlin at this period. So a call is now coming in for Harris to, to divert some of his resources 
to attack uh, these V1 sites. He's not happy. He does not want to do that. He had, it's the same. He's the same when he's asked to get involved in um, Operation Overlord and mm -hmm. part of the transportation plan and that. He doesn't want to um, divert. He sees this as a, a particular diversion. However, he's prepared to use some of his Sterling squadrons because the Sterlings, the Lancasters and the Halifaxes are taking the main uh, duties in, in, as part of main force at this point in the Battle of Berlin. So he's prepared to, to run some experimental raids with the Sterlings um, and also to bring in 617 Squadron as well, uh, the Downbuster Squadron, to carry out these um, experimental raids. So middle of December, a couple of raids take place. First one is against a place called Ailey La Haute Clocher, and I think we've got another image if we could share. Yeah. There we are. Cool. So this is a... Uh, this is a plot that I made based upon a plot um, of the attacks that was held at the, the National Archives. So Ailey La Haute Plusha is a, a ski site, and this was attacked by Stirlings on the night of 16th, 17th, 22nd, 23rd of December. And as you can see, you've got the target area there in purple, and then in the color, you've got what are called TIs. So that's target indicators that would have been dropped uh, in this case, they would have been dropped by mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes were using what was called oboe. Um, so oboe, very, very simplistically, the, the, the oboe aircraft would be flying along an arc. Uh, there'd, there'd be two um, stations in the, in the UK sending out signals. They'd be flying out an arc. And at a certain point in flying that arc, they'd get another signal. And that would tell them at which point to drop to release their, their target indicators. I mean, for some of these... Uh, V1 sites that they were attacking, the actual flight, that arc, started in the Thames estuary uh, before they get there. Mm. So they're using oboe, they're dropping the target indicators there, so you'd have these pools of pyrotechnics, of the pyrotechnic light that would, and then the main force would be coming in uh, and dropping their bombs on those target indicators. And you can see in the, the dots there, each of those is a crater. Plot, the plot of a crater. You can see the stick of bombs yeah. um, that, that, that goes across that. So that, that's two raids against a ski site. You can see there how many of them are actually in the target area. Now, if that was an attack on a target like the Krupp's work in Krupp's works in Essen, an area bombing attack, I think they'd be quite happy about that particular um, that bomb pattern. If we then, so that's what are uh, using the Sterlings. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to jump in and, and, and speak to you for a second because yeah. I think we're slightly distracted because, you know, the bombers are landing a mile away from the target and that sounds a long way. But actually, in, in bomber use, that's not very far away, is it? You know, I mean, we were lucky to get bombs even two and three miles away from the targets on, 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 on the big raids. So it's it's the, the the title of your book i think is very appropriate in the sense that you know we're trying to do something in a sense beyond what the capability of of bombing is you know we're trying to hit very precision targets with with a device that isn't really at that stage of the war quite quite set to do that but um we'll progress with your second image i just wanted to kind of make that point there um oh, no, no, no. we've had a question do you know the altitude of the bombs dropped on that particular ray we just showed what was that so the, the great dominion just asked that yeah, the Sterlings are operating at about 17,000 feet, I think. They're, so that's, that's sort of low-ish for high altitude, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, it, it's um, it's low when you compare it to the Halifax and the Lancaster. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly the Sterling guys didn't like being on raids with the Halifaxes and the Lancasters dropping bombs uh, bombs from above them. But even, even at that height, you see, that's a still a you, you, precision bombing. That's not precision bombing. And it become quite, we could go back into the, the history of Bomber Command and you go back to the Butt Report in 1941 that was showing that exposed the limitations of mm -hmm. bombing at night. And, and these guys are bombing at night. They were, I mean, this is probably another subject for talking about, Paul, but yeah. they're bombing at night because of losses that were suffered earlier in the war during the daylight raid. So there's the resultant loss um, in accuracy. But that sort of level, oboe, the use of oboe improves bombing accuracy in terms of the strategic air offensive, but in terms of um, 
attacking these particular targets, well, you need a level of precision that was not really capable. And, and Sir Arthur Harris knew this. He, was, he clearly knew this. I mean, I'll, after the next slide, I'll give you a quote of a letter that he wrote to the Air Ministry where he's... Um, yeah. Let's put the next... So the next one is um, FlixCore, yeah? So this Flix is FlixCore. So you've got... Yeah. So this is another ski site, tacked this M43. And again, you've got the target indicator there, which has been dropped by Obo. And each of those um, bomb craters there is a 12,000 pounder dropped by 617 Squadron. And, and the 617 Squadron Operation Record Book states that they claim this is the most accurate bombing of the war to date at that, at that particular time. And it certainly is quite a remarkable uh, accuracy that you've got there. However, it all comes down to where the target marker lands. Yeah. If the target marker's off, that yeah. light, then they can be as accurate as they like, um, but they they can't necessarily hit it. So you've got the you've got the two comparisons. You've got that more general bombing with the Sterlings, and you've got the precision uh, attacks later on. These are the twelve thousand pound. They're not tall boys. Tall boys come in later. Um, th these are the the twelve thousand pound of bombs. So I mean, Harris was quite clear when he was. Harris wrote to the Air Ministry in in January forty four. Um, and he talks about this and he said, the results as anticipated have been ineffective. And to quote another line from him, I do not in fact regard bombing of a pinpoint target at night by heavy bombers as a reasonable operation of war. So that's Harris talking in, in January, 1944. There is, a, there is an interesting aspect to the, because this campaign with Bomber Command, this experimental period was December and went through January 1944 as well. Um, the, the Daria Flak Regiment 155W, which is the launching regiment of the V1s, um, is at the Imperial War Museum. And each of the, the each of the Abtelung, so, which translates sort of as battalion, yep. uh, talks about it. And, yep. and they talk about um, whilst this was going on, the workers on the sites, as soon as they hear an aircraft, they're off. And there's nothing that's going to keep them there as well. And the Allies were using some delayed action bombs as well. So it, it impacted the building, the construction of the ski sites, and certainly the morale of the some of the Russian workers, the, the morale of some of the people who were building these, um, these ski sites. But what it certainly became apparent from these attacks to the Germans is that they were constructing these ski sites which were easily identifiable from the air you can pick up the skis very much. So there's a transition from um, the ski sites to what the Allies called modified sites. So you take away most of the construction, the V1s will be, they are, before the site is gonna be used, a few days before that, that's when they'll construct the launch ramp and then they'll use them. So this is a, a photograph of a modified site so as you can see, there's no skis there, none of, this, none of those stores. And you've got the letters. So if you look on the, the top right there, the letter B, that's the square building. So the V1 would go into there, be hung from the ceiling, and that's where the come, you'd get the alignment. And then it'd be taken to the launch ramp, which is A, and from there, um, that's where it'd be, be fired from. So, and the, fire, you, the, the, the V1, the way it's fired, very basically at the bottom of the ramp um, that the V1 would sit on sit on top of the ramp and there was like a tongue that came through to a hollow that went up the actual ramp and then that tongue it, it, there was a like a dumbbell inside that hollow and the tongue was joined onto the V1 and there'd be compressed steam would be generated at the base of the V1 force this dumbbell which would force the V1 up there and then the Argus pulse jet which is the distinctive sound everyone knows of the V1 would but then once it reaches the end of the ramp, there's enough speed for that then to take, uh, take it on and carry it on. So there's more of these, these modified sites um, starting to appear in, much more difficult to, to identify for ally reconnaissance. But if we could um, to go to the next slide, Paul. Picture. Yeah. So a bit of a test for everyone here. So this is set up as a, if you threw us, it's remarkable. If you view, view this through a stereoscope, how it becomes three dimensional. And immediately you can see um, 
where the, the, the ramp is, it is quite remarkable. So in here, there is, obviously it's, it's split set up the stereoscope, you've got a square building and a launch ramp. So actually, Paul, if you could just zoom out. Now, a way to find, the way the Allied Reconnaissance interpreters, they could find this out. If you remember I talked about that dumbbell that went up the center of the ramp, well, that would come out the end. And then some poor chap would be told, right, off you go, you need to go and retrieve that now, and off you go, and he's whatever he went to, to retrieve it. But that dumbbell would be scar, it would scar the land where it landed. So if you look in the fields where there's scarring, and then you, uh, so not the craters, if you come down sort of bottom left, you see that here, scarring there? Yeah. If you track back from that, keep going, keep, that's it. And then you're on the ramp. It's just, yeah, it's... Uh, oh, there we are. Yeah. That's it. So that's the ramp. And then just sort of, uh, what are we, south east of that is the square building. All uh, right. Yeah. 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 It's not, it's, not near, well, it's not a crossroads. It's like just um, to the right of the T-junction. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So that's the, that's the modified site. Um, and more of those are being, the, the ramps would not be there. I think, I think this photograph actually is from later on in the war, because you can see this has been attacked um, with, with the craters that are, are all around it. Um, and the ramps would not be put in place. The footings would be, but would not be put in place until it was ready to, a few days until it was ready to be used. Um, so yeah, so Bomber Command at the end of, pretty much at the end of January, stops attacking the, the uh, the V1 sites. There's other uh, other action it needs to get in, get involved in. The Americans still keep going. The Second Tactical Air Force is doing some. There are some bomber command attacks, but they're just minor um, mosquito attacks. And an Operation Overlord is coming, beginning of March, sixth, seventh of March. I think it is bomber command attacks. The traps rail yards and starts to get involved in the transportation plan in in the build up uh, to D Day itself. Um, uh, so before we actually get to the, the launch of the offensive as well, there was another way that the um, they were preparing to launch the V1s, and that's from these great huge underground, not underground, sorry, these great huge bunkers um, that they were building as well. So they were, um, so I think we've got a again another image. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll just have a glass of water there. Uh, so number seven, Syracor. There yeah. We go. So if ever you um, if ever you go to France, um, <clears throat> this is still there. You can walk across the walk across the roof. Um, I don't know if there, well, there's signs up, so I don't know if the farmers would get would object. But this is so this is an enormous construction here at, at Syracor. So the way this was planned to work in the middle of the image there, you've got like ent entry points. Yeah, the V ones would come in in rail tracks there. And then if you if you follow the bunker up, um, there's a little bit that's been cratered in just up on the top left of it. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But just down from that, you can just see a sort of a dip. Yeah, uh, <laughs> on the side. Well, the V1 would be put on the ramp inside there. The ramp would come out facing towards London uh, and they'd be launched from inside that particular bunker there. So they were looking to set, but Syracor is the most developed of these um mm. sites. there is one in in um Sherbourg peninsula that was being built but I, i've never i've never been there actually sotvast or Bre break or sotvast i, I forget yes. which ones but yeah, yeah i mean what i'm so what i'm taking on board i'm gonna just uh jump in for a second is sure. we, it's it's often a bit hard harder to measure what effect we're having on the germans because we're obviously changing the way they're doing things. So how, unless they, is there anything from the German side saying what a nuisance the raids were? You're causing us to change our technique. We're causing us to move. You know, how can we measure what success is happening be, sort of outside of the obvious destroying the targets? We're affecting their, um, their air program. Well, we get Enigma decrypts later. Yeah. So perhaps if we could come back to that once okay. they've actually launched, because then we can get some more, uh, more information. At, at this particular time, um, it's 
uh, reports coming from agents in France and the, and the reconnaissance is the pri prime indicator. But definitely the, the attack on the ski sites was definitely having a, um, had a significant impact in changing the, their, their policy. The, the larger sites, the one we look at Syracuse, they were all, all, always part of the plan. I mean, if we just stay with Syracuse, I don't know if we can go back to that image again, Paul. Yeah. Um, didn't launch a V1. Absolutely placid, the whole area um, attacked. So not, it, not damaging the actual construction itself. Well, that piece that I showed you that's slightly crated in, uh, further up on the, the left there, and you can still see that there, the, the, the bit of the concrete that's broken away. That's that's the result of a tall boy, 617 Squadron tall boy. Mm. But the whole area was so heavily crated as well, they couldn't get anything in um, to it on, on, uh, on the tracks, train tracks that were there. So, um, yeah, Syracuse was, was pretty much taken out. And then you've got some pretty large craters there as, there as well. Um, so yeah, so then we come to um, we come to the actual launch of the uh, the, the V1 offensive uh, itself. So D-Day, sixth of June, uh, and then the first launch of the V1s takes place on the twelfth, thirteenth of June, nineteen forty-four, um, and it was a it was a pretty much a, a bit of a pathetic effort, actually. Um, what was it? Church, uh, Cherwell called it. He said the mountain has mountain has grown and brought forth a forth a mouse. <laughs> it was quite <laughs> um, quite dismissive of it, but they quickly quickly remedied uh, the supply situation. Uh, and, and a couple of nights later, I think it was um, I'd have to look back at my notes. But I think it was something like 140, 150. Uh, V1s were launched, the 73 of which got, got through to London. So at this point, we're now, it's it's clear that the this is a, it's no longer a um, suggested threat, it's now become a, a material threat. That was the night of 15th, 16th of, of June 1944. And Eisenhower is quite clear and puts a lot of emphasis now on crossbow that needs to be countering um, what's taking place. It's worth just I think it's also worth pointing out that the attack, the strategic air offensive had also played its part in, in the, the V1 offensive from before. There was a raid, there were two raids on Cassell in October 1943 that hit the Fiesler works. They had a serious impact in the, um, in the production of the V1. And also, they're coming from Germany, the, the weapons, they need to get there by train. The transportation plan as part of support to overlord um which wasn't just as as we know it wasn't just in the normandy area and it was up in the pas de calais it was up in belgium as well as part of the of the deception plants so that had an impact on the supply side of the v1s as well uh, a sort of indirect effect um but 15th to 16th of june the v1s start coming over and start causing their um their damage uh, and there are the diver deployments put in place, the defensive deployment, the guns, the balloons, uh, the aircraft to shoot them down. They, they're flying quite low. The Tempest has a, quite a heavy involvement in that. Some of the later marks of Spitfire that could get get the speed, keep up with them. <coughs> Meteors, um, and then and the mosquitoes were involved in those as well. So you've got your gun belts, you know, fast fighter aircraft. You've got the balloons, but the key to the, the key to that to support that is you don't want your defences swamped. So reduce the number that are being fired gives a better opportunity to shoot down as many air, aircraft as, as you possibly. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a threefold thing, is it? There's limit the transportation of the Germans getting stuff and not just V ones, all their resources. I mean, you know, their their Panzer divisions in Normandy. So restrict their transport. Stop the V1s when they start coming over, and then also to limit the number, so it's the number coming over. So I think it's we've got to look at how large this operation is. I mean, there's a lot more to it than 
than perhaps we, we, we realize, and it'll come to it later on, when you get to the, the bomber commands, losses alone, just trying to deal with this threat. And, you know, yeah. I always make the point on my tours that, you know, as many civilians are dying in London, in a sense, to V1 and V2s as are, as are dying in the in the hedgerows of Normandy in the offensive. It's, uh, mm. this is a big deal. This is a big issue. And and it, and, and the Germans, of course, also feeding on the, on the, on the propaganda of it all as well, isn't it? They're, they're, they've been losing and now they've got this, this wonder weapon. They've got this weapon of all that's kind of increasing their morale. So this is a this is a big deal and i now i think remarks in his diaries about the morale effect on london as well he, mm. he just just when he's won them over with an invasion and we're on that we're feeling like the war is is turning you know finally going our way and there's now you know these deadly things falling out the sky so it's it's important in in many ways practically and 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 in in terms of simply the morale of the population but i'll let you get back to explaining what bomber command are doing well uh, well uh, well no absolutely paul and um but the V2 hasn't come over yet. That doesn't come over till September. No. We're just talking about the, the, the V1s at the moment. And probably another talk with someone who may well, who will know more about it than I do, is the deception that was fed to the Germans about where these V1s were coming down. Yeah. yeah. Going through double agents. Because um, the V1 had a, a counter. Once the counter revolved a certain number of times, cut the engine out of the shops. They're trying to find out where are these V1s dropping. And the agents are telling either they're short or they're long. They're trying to deceive them so that they overshoot or they undershoot. Um, you know, that, that's probably another talk <laughs> that you could have with someone. Definitely. So um, you've got the, the Allied Air Commanders would meet at the Allied Air Commanders Conference pretty much daily at this point, and uh, they would discuss the targeting and what needs to be doing. And they, very, they started going after more of these sites, modified sites now and ski sites, and also what was called supply sites. The Allies called them supply sites. So there was, um, there's about eight of those. So Dom Leisure, um, I've got to tell you some of the names. So this is part of the supply system. Sautricor, Beauvoir, Dom Leisure, Renescure. So Bomber Command is going after these and Harris is not particularly happy about going after these as well. And it's noticeable in that sort of that weekly period um, Two week period actually, and we'll show you there's a graph that we'll show at the end of the chat we're having tonight that there's not much of a diminishing in the actual um, number of V1s that are coming across. And it becomes clear that the supply sites are, are, are not attacking them, is not having a, an effect on the number of, of V1s that are coming across. But what does, um, I mean, is it the scale that took? part of this part, there's the 24th, 25th of June, um, it is. And um, I think I'm correct without referring to the, but I think about 700 heavy bombers attacked seven sites on that particular night. I mean, that's an extraordinary number <laughs> attacking, you know, just such a, um, a small small site there, uh, just a, a ramp. Yeah. Land a bomb could land a mile away. Well, you're not just attacking, attacking a ramp. So an enormous, enormous number of aircraft, enormous amount of resources being thrown at it. It's not having an effect. But then we get to a series of attacks that do have a significant effect. And that's the attacks on the caves where the V1s are what's called the storage depots. So the Allies become aware in particular of a place called St. Louis d'Esseron uh, to the north of Paris. So these are mushroom caves, un underground caves. Um, you can go there. I, when I was researching for the book, I had a lovely lady who was actually there when it was attacked. And actually it took me in, inside the caves and you can see where all the, the um, ceiling has been uh, collapsed in there. So the V1s would come in on a train line there and then they'd be taken into these un underground cave entry entrances. So if you look sort of like towards the bottom-ish, there's a, the tunnel entrances. Yeah, that's it. You've got those arrows pointing yeah. um, where they would go, uh, go into there. So this was now clearly and, and agents could report this. This was clearly now part of the, the supply system to get the V1s into the supply depots, beg your pardon, into the storage depots. And then from there, they'd go out by truck to the modified sites, uh, and then they'd, they'd be the firing. So Bomber Command decides to go for an, an attack against St. Louis Desseron. The first raid is on the 4th, 5th of July, 44. 617 Squadron go in, initially with tall boys. Uh, they've got them at this 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 point. I think it was the eighth of June they first used their talk boys on the Samoa Rail Tunnel. But six one seven comes in, and I think it's just over um, 
200, I think it's 230 main force bombers come in, supported by mosquitoes as well, and the attack attack the the St. Louis tunnels. The next day, um, next couple of days, Allied intelligence is able to pick up uh, from intercepts the results of the, that particular raid. Um, I can read that if you like, just a little bit from, the, from that intercept. So this is from um, from uh, Salou Desron to 65th Army Corps, who, who was sort of like the overseeing body of, of the, the V offensive in the area. Installation attacked by heavy bombers. Several hundred bombs of heavy and heaviest caliber dropped. Cavern entrance clear. Approach roads, railway installations destroyed. Approach from St. Lou probably repaired within 24 hours. Casualties amongst ammunition depot personnel, five men missing. Among flak personnel, five dead, six wounded, six to seven missing. In cavern, no penetration, communications out of action. So that's the fourth and fifth. So bomber command goes again, 7th, 8th of July. They attack again, this time with just over, again, well, again, just over 200 uh, heavy bombers. That night, they are intercepted by night fighters, and there's one of the, one of the heaviest air battles takes place over Germany uh, on, on that, that particular night. I think it was 33, um, I'd have to refer back to my book again, but I think it was 33 aircraft uh, were lost on, on that particular night attacking wow. the target. But it had a, that had a significant impact, a, a very important um, effect. I mean, the Luftwaffe is not defeated. It's, we, we have, uh, you could say, local air superiority over the Normandy um, battlefields during during that period. But at night time, the the, the Nacht Jagdgeschwader are still very potent. They did they shot the guys down on the Malay Le Comte raid before before D Day itself, and here they are doing the same thing at Saint Louis Desron as well. But anyway, the raid has a significant uh, effect. If we go. We've got a next slide, Paul. Which, uh, um, where are we? Uh, there we go. I don't know how easy it is to make out necessarily on our, but you can see, I mean, the area is just absolutely mullered, <laughs> so to speak. You've got some, um, some of the craters from the tall boys there as well. But the whole area is absolutely... Uh, devastated um i can't remember his name now but the chap who wrote the darling buds of may he worked with um the allies and he visited the area after just just after the area was liberated and talks about it just being a, a quagmire and everywhere from all the transport in or whatever was just absolutely wiped out so a significant impact now the allies pick up from this again enigma decrypts that there's going to be a shift in emphasis of the storage of the bombs to a place they call Nord Pol or Nucor, which is more underground caves. Um, and the Allies pick this up, and a few days later, Bomber Command bombs Nucor. And the other, another significant storage depot for the V1s was the um, rail tunnels at Really La Montagne as well, and Bomber Command attacked attack those quite quite famous it's not when bill reed won his vc um, but bill reed vc was shot down on that on, on that particular raid and the allies are receiving the intelligence that's coming through these these the, the effect that these are having now on the, on the story depot so these are now significant impacts and we, we'll, we'll, we'll show a graph soon um, which shows um i believe it shows the impact of those particular raids the significance of those particular raids um, Bomber Command keeps attacking because there's a ship, there's a, they start moving their supply storage sites to Bois de Cassin, Tivoli, uh, Trossi, St. Maximin. Um, and there again, as soon as they're identified, they're attacked. St. Lou Desseron was again attacked in, in August of 44. Um, a VC was one, Basil Jet on his VC when he, he thought he injured men in his aircraft, he landed his. Is Lancaster and sadly uh, it exploded and he lost his life. He's buried at Senant, just there. I mean, the, I'm sure you are fully aware of this, but Basil, Get, Basil Jet's grave is, you know, in a local small church cemetery and is <coughs> immaculately kept, and they they commemorate him every every year. Um, 
he was a, a pathfinder. And then, then you're now at the point where it's getting into August. Now the Allied armies are starting to advance and they're starting to overrun the sites and they're having to, um, they're having to withdraw the, the launching uh, battalions. Uh, are having to withdraw and they can overrun the sites and they, you, you can see uh, see some of the damage that's taking place. And then there is a, France is liberated, Paris, Paris is liberated. Um, the launching of the V1s now is retreating back towards Germany. Antwerp starts to become a target. Uh, and also they start launching V1s from Heinkels. So flying them out to the um, middle, of, middle of the channel and then uh, releasing them and then back then back the Heinkels would go and uh, allies knew that this was happening one way they knew this was happening is that they were able to identify square buildings on some of the airfields in Holland mm. showed that the, the V1s were there but the, the threat would really pretty much diminished by this to England and had pretty much uh, diminished there were still the attacks on some quite horrific incidents in Antwerp yeah, this this point, and bomber command really is no, is no longer having any um, involvement. And then in September, the V two is coming over as well, which is a whole different. How do you another show, it? another subject? We'll do that another one. Yeah. How do you counter? You can't counter that. Um, that, that that's a whole different yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I was losing your audio a bit. There's back again now. So let's talk about this graph. We've got to the point of the graph now because I think it's very interesting. So I'm gonna put it up on screen. So explain, explain. Well, it, it, it's kind of self self evident, I think, but um, I'll, I'll let you explain more. So this is based on the diary of Flat Regiment One Five Five W, and it takes the bars. They're the um, number of V ones that they're recording that are fired uh, each each day. So you've got the pretty. Uh, the mountain groaning and bringing forth a mouse, a mouse on the 13th of June, and then there's the recovery, um, and then you've got the, uh, the the launch taking place. And I've I've put on there a seven day a week seven day weekly average to give sort of like a better feel um, of what's happening. Interestingly, the 24th 25th of June night is a very low one. Um, that's when. The 700 bombers were flying over attacking those seven sites and they record in the the diary of the regiment that they didn't fire many that night because they thought they'd be revealing where all the launch sites were to the bombers that were overhead um, which is which is quite interesting i think the allies pretty much knew where they were anyway but i think as you can see you get the salute decimal which is the big the s's the two s's and then the new core attacks um and there's quite a diminishing in the launch rates that take place over that particular period. Now, the, the, the Allied land arm is the battle. I mean, we haven't taken Khan at that point. So the Allied the land battle is still still very much taking place uh, in Normandy. So um, I think this is very much a consequence of the attack on those um, mm -hmm. sort of storage depots. And I mean, the book, I, I've got numbers and it reduces. If it had carried on the same, it would have been about another thousand V1s would have, would have gone across in that period. Um, went across a, a bit of a recovery when they're using the other storage depots and then it starts dropping again and you're getting towards um now they're starting to overrun the sites so it's, it's staying at a low level it's quite useful that fact when that drop is taking place there's a redeployment going on for the defenses in in this country there was early on there were no particular exclusive areas of responsibility with regards to fighter aircraft and guns uh, the gun belts and they were able to shift and move gun belts uh, in that particular period when that's dropping off, which I think was a, a secondary, I, I doubt it was intentional, um, but I no doubt it helped whilst that was taking place. And the percentage of V1s that are being shot down in the periods now are rising, of course. Percentage that, that there's less to shoot down, but they're not being overwhelmed. So they can actually, um, they can actually get more of them. So, I mean, my estimates there, well, that's my estimates there. I think showing the impact that Bomber Command had um, in regard to protecting, and it, in regards to it, it's a strategic air offensive weapon acting in a de defending London, directly defending uh, the capital. But was it worth the cost? Well, that's always um, always the question. I don't know if we go on to the next. Uh, well, let's, yeah, I'll bring it up, then I'll, then I'll, I'll put some thoughts in. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah, this when you sent me these images to prepare for the show, that I was, frankly, I was shocked um, <laughs> at the the quantities. Um, mm. Way more than I would have would have guessed. Yeah, I mean that great. That's that's one of the French um, sandwiches as well. That that's a crew. I think they were shot down on that twenty fourth, twenty fifth of June night. That's the, the uh, I think that's I think one of those grades has got two of the chaps in. So I think that's the entire crew. So yes, the Allied air losses on crossbow operations. So this isn't just B one. This is B weapon operations. Um, it's quite considerable. And then bomber command lost two hundred fifty three aircraft. 1771M, and so that includes the 40 aircraft that were lost on the Pinamunda raid as well. Mm. Um, and of those airmen, um, you're probably only looking at a few hundred who actually survived. The vast, the majority of those those lads would have lost lost their lives. So it's quite a, um, a staggering number of men. And after the war, the uh, Air Ministry did a sort of comparison of the of the resources that went into the V, the V weapon offensive and comparing it to, to how much resource the allies had to put in. And you could almost view that the V1 campaign was a tactical victory for the, for the Germans in terms of the amount of resources that were lost, that were put into it and, and lost. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that's a point, isn't it? In, in the, it's, it's, it's fairly low. It's, <laughs> Then yeah, it, it's not in, uh, labor intensive particularly um, for the yeah. Germans. It's it's uh, fewer resources for a, for a bigger effect. And I think, you know, what I've I've been fascinated by with this show is just how much of an effort was put in by us that that summer or that that year to do this. And it goes against this trend. We have this idea that kind of June the sixth onwards we're winning, and with the, uh, the as you said, the where the word air supremacy get bandied about everywhere and it, as you say it's it's in certain areas yes but in other areas no and that graph was definitely going down the trend was definitely going down but i think it's like when we talk about um the effect of bomber command general and you're you're the expert not me and we look at these statistics and say well the germans are still producing tanks they're still producing ammunition they're still producing and, I, and the answer is yes but they're not producing more that we don't know that that graph could have gone up I mean, yeah. if the Germans had not been under our bombs, that that graph, what they're achieving, could have gone up. At least, yeah. at the very least, we prevented it going up. But I think actually we did actually send it downwards anyway. So that's that thing. The bombing of it's not just about reducing it; it's it's reducing it, reducing it, increasing. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the I think the um, I think I'm correct that they're, they're intending to send over about thirty thousand of these things and and ten thousand were fired across. It's a few on either yeah. side. So um, when the United States Strategic Bombing Survey did did some research into this, uh, and, and Cherwell as well reports that they think they reduced it to about a third the originally intended um, number of, of the ones that were coming across. I mean, whether whether the allocation of the resources into the V-weapon offensive, the, the V-3, the down at Mimoyak and the V-2, whether those resources could have better helped the Germans somewhere else. You know, think of all that concrete that was going into Syracuse and the ski sites and the buildings. If that had been put into more of the Atlantic Wall, um, although the Atlantic Wall is not just Normandy, it's vast, isn't it? But could that have had an effect? I mean, that's a, an argument that could be theorized about. Um, but the threat was important and the bomber lads um, stepped in and, and they, they made quite, in comparison, it was quite a high sacrifice um, in terms of the number of lives lost to save the, the numbers. Oh, yeah, because they're about, uh, what was it? I think it, it oh, I'd have to look, it, look up exactly, but you know, the number of civilian casualties in terms of deaths was not particularly high from the V1s. Um, so, you know, you're stopping a thousand V1s coming over, coming over, you're stopping a thousand lives being lost in. Uh, in London, but it's costing you uh, an, an enor enormous number of uh, lives of bomber aircraft who are trained up, and uh, and aircraft that cost as well. Well, then, then you're into that bigger philosophical discussion of the chess game of World War Two, and is sacrificing a pawn there, the saving a bishop over there, worth doing? It's it, it all gets um very complicated, but um 
Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the point is the operations to, to, to stop V1s, you, you, you said it yourself, you know, about a third of those sent over that they, they anticipated. So, you know, you've got, you've got to measure it as some level of success, but, you know, the, the, the losses were, were, were huge. But then what would the Bomber Command have been doing if they hadn't been doing the Operation yeah. Crossbow stuff? Would they have been use, losing the losses there as well? It's these things get, these things get, um, the counterproductive in it to a certain extent the point is the decision was made to do it they had an yeah. effect and lots of lives were lost in 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 this cause and i think that's all, all you've got to say really and I, to me it's just been fascinating to to to, to at, look at an aspect that i i didn't know as much about as i should do none of us know <laughs> enough about the, the war because you just go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole. and i'm getting some questions coming in about the v1s um from hind kills things like that and i think well we'll yeah. do that on another day because you're a bomber yeah. command guy but there's a there's a potential of doing a, a v programs a special with a panel of people people who know about the german side of it the rocket technology yeah. they know about the the countermeasures the the intelligence the sabotage and you say that the spying like, that was um that was the the, the the that was the that was the um eddie chapman wasn't it was one of the ones the germans had who got the iron cross who was one of the ones working for the germans telling them working for us that the, the they moved the map down two sections didn't they so the germans are sending them over thinking they were going to land there that's a very simple way of looking at it. but there's a whole yeah. there's a whole Absolutely. yeah set of rabbit holes we can go down with v weapons and, and it'd be fascinating to do but for the point of this evening i think we've covered that very well steve so um that was good <laughs> i i enjoy i i'm not gonna say i enjoyed it because it's not i don't like listing about how many people were killed but you know what i mean i yeah. i enjoyed increasing my learning and you're welcome on any any time you want to come and talk about this and for a book you wrote however many years ago it's all surprised you didn't have to refer <laughs> to your notes more i you know it's uh I, I read things in the morning and forget them by the afternoon that's how my brain is going these days but anyway um if for those watching, um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I've got on Saturday uh, thinking we still may try and do our Piets and Panzerfaust show. The only thing is I've kind of lost my German expert on the Panzerfaust. I will try and find a replacement expert. If not, I will postpone that event to another time in February or March. If not, it will be the Go For Broke special coming up as our next one about the movie about the 442nd, the Nisai Japanese-American unit starting out in Hawaii with Stacey and her friends. That'll be good. But um, anyway, I'm going to bring it to an end now. So thank you very much for doing this, Steve. There's still conversations going on about the civilian losses and and their crews lost, which I, I always say to people, go back and look at the comments on YouTube because there's as many things, good things going on there as there is myself and Steve talking. And we're very grateful that we've got people in the comments who know us, who, who know so much. The Great Dominion yes. who always comments. There's some real experts watching these shows. And my point yeah. is, why aren't you on the shows? If you know so much, come on and talk about our subject yourself. So um, anyway, thank you very much, Steve, for for um, for joining us. You'll be back on again in February. And uh, Sean's website details are in the in the description below. Um, and he's also an author, a publisher as well as an author. He publishes people like Sean Feast and others. And there's a book on, on Group Captain Massey uh, just come out, which we'll be doing a show on later on. So yes. thank you very much for joining us, Steve. Don't forget, everybody, check, it out, check us out on uh, Patreon. Don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to share what we're doing with your friends on so social media and, and give Steve a follow if you haven't already. And it's me, Paul Woodadge, saying thank you very much. We'll see you all again on World War II TV very, very shortly. Thank you very much for watching.